morning, Claudio. We are on week two of our three-week series titled Home Improvement. Last Sunday, as you probably remember, those that were gathered here, we focused on honoring parents, especially our mothers. Today, we're going to switch our focus to the guys. And we're going to explore what Scripture says is God's model for manhood, which is another aspect of our home improvement. When we think about men, we all have ideas what men are like. Here are some of Rick Warren's ideas. There are many, but I'm going to only share three types. First, for men, there is the Rambo type. These are the kind of guys that deny all their feelings. They ignore the law. They never worry. They never complain. They never apologize. They just sweat. (laughs) I see some of you guys resonate with that one. The second is the Archie Bunker type. These guys belittle their wife and children. They think they rule their family by talking tough and being critical. But in reality, everyone is ridiculing them behind their back. The third type is the George Costanza type from Seinfeld. They are so clueless that they are constantly outwitted by others and no one takes them seriously. Let's compare those ideas and other ideas you may have about what men are like to God's model for manhood as presented in Philippians 2, verses 19 to 30, which is our passage for today. The greatness is not determined of a man by his, the the value of his wealth, but by the wealth of his godly values. One way to understand what values a godly man should possess is by examining the life of godly men in Scripture. In today's passage, Paul shares about two believers Timothy and Epaphroditus. Don't you like that name, Epaphroditus? Wish I was named Epaphroditus. Wouldn't that be cool? But anyway, people wouldn't forget you, right? But in today's passage, Paul shares about these two believers, Timothy and Epaphroditus, and the godly values they possessed. In the first part of Philippians um, 2, verse 20, when referring to Timothy, Paul says, I have no one else like Timothy. In Philippians 2, 29, when referring to Epaphroditus, Paul says, we need to honor people like Epaphroditus. Well, let's look at our passage and let's see what godly values or characteristics are reflected in Timothy and Epaphroditus' lives. Would you please stand with me and we'll read our passage together out loud. Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 to 30. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I'm all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor men like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. You may be seated. We'll pray. Lord, I just pray right now that you would help us to set aside anything that may be occupying our mind and have our soul focus be centered on you for the next 20 minutes. Lord, we want to hear from you what you have in store for us. Lord, may the words that come from my tongue be from you. And Lord, may your Holy Spirit help each of us to take in what we need to take in 
and apply what we need to apply to our lives. In your name we pray, amen. Well, our passage for today is divided into two sections. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 to 24 is our first section. And in this section, Paul focuses his attention on his co-worker, Timothy. And then in verses 25 to 30, which is our second section, Paul focuses his attention on Epaphroditus. Paul taught that like Timothy and Epaphroditus, the mission of, the, of a Christian is to serve rather than to be served. So let's look at verses 19 through 21, which state, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare, for everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Paul states that he's sending Timothy because first, he has no one like him. And second, Timothy is focused on the gospel, not on his own interests. It's such a rare thing to find a man like Timothy who promotes the welfare of other people. A godly man is other-centered. Write that down. Put it in your phone. There's going to be four of them today. This is the first. A godly man is other-centered, just like Timothy was. God is looking for men who, like Timothy, are more concerned about what other people need. In other words, they are other-centered rather than being self-centered. Many of us men, and I'm sure most of us gathered here today, need to grow in our other-centeredness as we spend a lot of our time making sure our needs and wants are met, and we invest little time helping others. When I was in seminary, one of my professors, Dr. Grant Osborne, who's written many texts on the New Testament and commentaries and so forth, he shared a story with us. It was a true story. One day he was teaching, and there was a break in the class, so he looked out the window, and he noticed that a person had fallen and slipped on ice and was laying on the sidewalk. And then he witnessed four students just pass right on by this person that had slipped and fallen and looked distressed. And then the fifth student came along, and this person helped the person. Well, some of those students made their way into Dr. Grant Osborne's class, who happened to be hosting that day the final exam. These pastors in training displayed self-centeredness as opposed to other-centeredness. Reminds me of the modern-day reenactment of the Good Samaritan account. I'm glad I was not in this scene because I totally could see myself in too big of a hurry to help. I mean, these students are headed for a final exam. That's important, right? Do you think any professor, especially this professor, Dr. Grant Osborne, is going to give you extra time to take the final because you showed up late? I wonder how many times in my life has God watched me pass by a person in need and because I was in a hurry or thought someone else would help, I just passed by. Men, how would you rate yourselves on being others-centered? A good way for you to answer this question and future questions today is for you to evaluate yourself, then ask your wife. Ask your kids. Ask your family. Ask your workmates how they would evaluate you. These are the people that see you in action day in and day out. They see how you spend your time. They see how you spend your money. They can see, is he focused on others or is he focused on himself? God wants Christian men who, like Timothy, put other people's concerns and needs before their very own. Let's look at verse 22, which states, But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. The Philippians knew how Timothy had stood the test and proved his worth. Paul says that Timothy worked with him like a son works alongside his father. This was expected in Paul's day, that a son should learn his trade from his father. So the Philippians knew that Timothy was going to be with them after being trained by Paul, and they also knew that Timothy was focused on the gospel. A godly man is consistent and dependable. Write that down, put that in your phone. A godly man 
is consistent and dependable, just like Timothy was. In verse 22, it says, Timothy, whose name means he honors God, Timothy has proved himself as he served with Paul in the work of the gospel. Timothy had his character and his integrity tested and was found to be consistent and dependable. Timothy did not give in to societal pressure, but kept his life focus on the gospel. You know, if you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. Amen. God wants men who are dependable. And to be dependable, one needs to be consistent in their Christian convictions and behavior. In other words, they're committed to God and how to live out the Christian faith and are not swayed by what others expect them to say, be, or do. Look at Proverbs 10.9, which states, A man of integrity walks securely, but he who takes crooked paths will be found out. Godly living is built on character, not an image. Our private lives need to be congruent and consistent with our public lives in order to be dependable for God. Inconsistent and undependable men create insecure children because the children are uncertain of dad's stances. The same is true for marriages. An inconsistent or an undependable husband produces an unstable marriage. God wants men to be dependable to help further his purposes in their, in their families and in the world. Personally, for me, this can be very challenging at times. I want to be the same at home in my private life as I am in, at work in my public life, as I view my whole life as a minister, and I want to represent Christ well at all times. I gear up in my pastoral role to be available and compassionate to everyone I meet. And then when I get home, the natural man inside of me just says, I want to relax, I want to unwind, I want to stop serving for the day. But guess what? When I get home, much of my serving for the day has just begun. I need to make sure I'm consistent and dependable, not only at work, but at home too. Am I using my marbles wisely with my kids, spending time with my wife, focusing on her, just like I do with my work obligations? Men, how are you doing on being consistent and dependable? Our life focus, like Timothy's, needs to stay centered on the gospel. And God wants to, us Christian men to be dependable in the sense that we are committed to God and how to live out the Christian faith and we're not swayed by what others expect us to be or do or say. Being dependable and consistent helps make an impact for Christ in our world. Let's move to the second section of our passage, verses 25 to 30, which focuses on another of Paul's associates, Epaphroditus, who was a Philippian. He lived out self-sacrificing service, which is the main point of the book of Philippians. The Philippians had sent Epaphroditus as a representative to bring gifts to Paul and stay with him if necessary and give Paul whatever help he needed. Let's look at verses 25 and 26, which state, but I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs, for he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Paul states three relationships he had with Epaphroditus that reflect teamwork. Brother, worker, soldier. These words are used by Paul to describe those who work with him to get the gospel to the unreached people. A godly man is a team player. Write that down. A godly man is a team player as Epaphroditus was. Here Paul shows us teamwork, not competition, in ministry with Epaphroditus. First Christians are brothers. We are part of a spiritual family. Paul uses the word brother 133 times in the New Testament to describe the relationship between Christians. Christians are co-workers with other Christians. Christians have this same work to pursue. We all have the great commission to pursue. Christians are fellow soldiers. Christians need to work together, not compete with one another, as we are enemies of the devil. Christians need to defend, protect, and support each other. Men, 
Can other Christians use this phrase about you and me? Can they say he's a team worker in ministry to describe you? When I think of men demonstrating teamwork, I think of Kyle Thurston. I went to basic training or boot camp when I was 17 years old, and that's the earliest possible date you can go, age you can go, and I signed up to join the Army at the youngest age you can join. Well, the average age of men in my unit with me was 24 years old. I met Kyle Thurston on the airplane ride to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, and we had an instant connection. Both of us were Christians, and the second thing is, he was just as clueless as I was about what's going to happen next. <laughs> but I'll never forget how even though I did not know him well in the beginning, I took a risk. And I gave him my extra key for my wall locker, and he did the same for me. You're like, what's the big deal with that? In my unit, when you gave your wall locker key the re to the recipient, it's saying, I am committed to you and all that I have, even my money, because you have access to it. You don't give someone your spare key to your wall locker unless you know you can trust that person, unless you know that he has your back. I banked on one thing. Kyle is a Christian. Together, Kyle and I as a team, with God's help, we made it through basic training. We grew in our faith. We reached out to others who committed their lives to Christ. We did ministry and lived out our faith during one of the most challenging times in my life. Men, how would you rate yourselves on this, on being a team player in ministry? God wants us men like Epaphroditus and Paul working together as a team in ministry, as Christian brothers, as co-workers, as fellow soldiers. Let's look at our last three verses, verses 28 through 30. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. Epaphroditus must go home to Philippi so the Philippians would be glad that he's alive and well. And so Paul would have less anxiety than he would have had Epaphroditus stayed with Paul or had Epaphroditus died. Then Paul directs the Philippians to welcome and respect Epaphroditus because he just about lost his life carrying out this important ministry he did on behalf of the Philippian Christians. Epaphroditus needs to be honored not just for what he did, but also because of why he did it. Epaphroditus was courageous, and he risked his life to help Paul for the cause of Christ, doing what other Philippian Christians did not or could not do. A godly man is bold in Christ. I write that down. A godly man is bold in Christ, just like Epaphroditus was. God is looking for men who possess fearlessness, who are willing to serve him and risk for the kingdom of God, who are willing to serve God with reckless abandonment. The world says the goal in life is to become secure, and uh, don't focus your life on serving God. God says we are to focus our lives on serving the Lord, and rather than striving to become financially secure and independent. Epaphroditus risked his life and almost died for the work of Christ to make up for the help the Philippians could not give to Paul. I love what Romans 12, 1 through 2 says, and I'm going to read it, and if you know it, read it with me. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. Offer yourselves. Ask yourself, what have I volunteered for lately for the cause of Christ? Men, if you are sitting here today and thinking that you're bored and unfulfilled, maybe it's because you're not risking it. You're not challenging yourself with goals that are bigger than yourself. Mark 8.35 says, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, 
And whoever loses life with me in the gospel will what? Save it. After years of resisting God's call to go into full-time Christian ministry, my wife Julie and I, after much prayer and consultation with our pastor, decided in the summer 1993 that we're going to risk it all. We're going to yield our careers to God and let him use us to serve him. You see, our careers, like maybe some of you sitting here today, were at the center of our lives. And we realized that God wanted to be at the center. So we said, what do we need to do? We need to yield that to God. Well, there's a long story to this journey, but let me share with you one sign of God's provision. I remember making a deal with God. Now, some of you sitting here say, you don't make deals with God. I was a commodity trader, so this just made sense to me. (laughs) So here was my deal. I said, and I prayed to God, God, I will do whatever you want me to do for my career in ministry, but you need to provide for me and my family. That was it. Big one, but that was it. Okay, so that particular day in the summer of 1993, I drove with my resignation letter in my car to an early morning dentist appointment to have my teeth cleaned prior to going to work. On my drive, I prayed to God. I said, I wrote this resignation letter, but if you don't want me to turn it in, stop me. And God, if you want me to turn this in, show me just one little sign, just one little sign today that you will provide for me and my family. I arrive at Larry's office, probably 7.30 in the morning, and I sit in his dentist chair. Larry's a Christian, part of the church I was a part of. And he looks at me and he says, you seem bothered today. And I told him, I said, today's a big day for me. Huge. Today, I'm planning on resigning from my commodity trading job. I'm going to go with my wife to seminary full-time, and then I'm going to go into full-time Christian ministry. Do you know what he said to me? He looked me right in the eyes and he said, Todd, today and for every day of your life, you and your family's dental needs will be taken care of by me for no charge. I just felt the tears rolling down my cheeks. And I kept my contact, but I said, that's the sign. God showed me a sign that he's going to provide for me and my family. I just need to be brave. And take the next step following him. And I did. I resigned that day. I risked my vocation. And guess what? God provided then, and he continues to provide today. I moved my vocation out of the way, put God at the center, and he is providing. Men, how would you rate yourselves on being bold in Christ? God wants men who are bold and willing to serve him and risk it for the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but there's one verse in this passage that just really bothers me. And I think it's very sad. When I read verses 20 and 21, Paul says about Timothy, I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare, for everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Why aren't there more men then and today who live out the godly values possessed by Timothy and Epaphroditus. I've seen this conflict arise in marriages where husbands are passive. The wife is often more interested in growing in her maturity in Christ, but the husband is not. Where she had some men, rather than being the spiritual leader of his home, dislikes his wife's spiritual growth and limits it. Men, one of the greatest challenges you and I will ever face in life is to live for Jesus Christ in front of your wife. Live for Jesus Christ in front of your kids. Live for Jesus Christ in front of your family. Live for Jesus Christ in front of your workmates. Timothy and Epaphroditus did. And they were just ordinary guys. Yet 2,000 years later, we're still talking about them. Will your life make any difference? Will my life make any difference? For the kingdom of God, it can. Guys, with God's help, let's commit to work on this aspect, God's model for manhood of our home improvement. Men, would you please stand? 
Before we leave today, I want to give you a challenge and I want to give you a blessing. And I'd like you to stay standing for both. Men, one way colonial has, is, has a way to help you grow in these four values of godly manhood and more is for you to be mentored by another colonial Christian man. Similar to the way that Paul was mentored, or Paul mentored Timothy. Or maybe God wants you to help sharpen other men by you mentoring someone else. If God is calling you to be mentored or be a mentor, please contact me and we'll get you plugged in. As mentoring is the focus of our colonial men's ministry. And it is incredible what God is doing in the lives of men that are in these mentoring relationships. Right now, 60 of us, including me, are being challenged what it means to live out biblical humility in our lives. And I'd love for you to be a part of that. And now if you close your eyes, we're going to give a blessing over you. Would you all pray with me, please? Lord, we thank you for the lives of Timothy and Epaphroditus and how in this passage your lives reflect the godly values. Today you've brought these men standing here to worship at Colonial, and we want to bless them. Lord, may your Holy Spirit help each of them to fully commit their lives to you. And may your Holy Spirit descend upon them in a way that they've never felt your presence before, that, they would lead, that you would lead and guide each of them to take the next step to be other-centered, to be consistent and dependable, to be a team player in ministry and to be bold in carrying out your mission. Help them to be godly with their words and their actions and their relationship with their family, with their friends, and with their coworkers. Lord, give each of them your desires to carry out your will on earth. Help each of them to value what you value. Shape each of them to be godly men. I lift them each up to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.